Invite all to the way of your Lord with wisdom. Now we start the third session of the symposium in which we have the audience and press participation session. This would be the clarification of the question answer session, but as one of the brothers has told me that we wanted a briefing on Dr. Zakir, he is from out of Calicut, the other speakers we know them. So I would just say in short, I would just give a briefing. Dr. Zakir Naik. He is a medical doctor by professional training and has turned around to make Dawa the proper presentation, understanding, clarification and appreciation of Islam as well as removing misconceptions about Islam amongst Muslims as well as non-Muslims, his primary mission in life. With the Holy Quran and the Islamic way of life as his perfect base, fully reinforced by his dynamic data and analysis on the complete compatibility of Islam with the logic, reason and science. As you have seen, he speaks with renewed righteousness and infallibility of Islamic teaching. Recently, recently he had been on a lecture tour from 17 September to 24th October to USA, UK and Canada, visiting many cities like Toronto, Montreal, Halifax, Hamilton, New York, Ottawa, Atlanta, Chicago, Indianapolis, Houston, Los Angeles, Birmingham, Leicester, London and many other cities. On returning back he had been to Madras for a three day eight lectures tour. Returning back to Bombay he had a major lecture on Quran and modern science, conflict or conciliation in which we had a long question answer session in which the press and the audience could cross examine him as well as leading scientists of Bombay could cross examine him on the topic. After that he had a lecture tour of Bangalore for two days. Immediately the next two days he gave six lectures over two days and I think on 13th to 18th of December he was in Singapore for a six lecture tour from 19th to 24th of December he was in Malaysia for another 6-7 lectures and 4 national television programs. On returning back to Bombay on 25th uh, with a what's one and a half day rest he was back in Trichur amongst your people of Kerala. The first visit and he has appreciated that a lot, he enjoyed it a lot and today also it has been an interesting session being amongst you all before he moved to Cochin tomorrow and back to Bombay day after. He is on the move either whether he is in Bombay or out of Bombay and the appreciation he gets for his studies as a student of Islam as well as comparative religion from all the people who come to hear him makes him strive harder to carry on more and more. Thank you very much for all your support. We start the third session, the question and answer session. We have our three learned speakers here, Swami Golakananda of Sri Ramakrishna Math. In the center, next to me, respected Father Gio Payapalli of the direct, who is the director of the Naya Jyotis Renewal Center and on my extreme left, Dr. Zakir Naik, President Islamic Research Foundation. Uh, I will just outline the rules to be observed during the question and answer session so that we get more uh, for everyone present here in the less time available. The first rule is press will be given first preference to ask questions. They are counted as responsible people who report and inform the masses at large. So they will be given first chance. If they have to ask questions, they may kindly identify themselves when they line up that we are the press and they are the volunteers would give them a first preference. Questions asked should be on the topic religion in the right perspective or concept of God in religion only. Questions not relevant to the topic will not be entertained. 
please state which of the three speakers you are putting your question forward to. As uh, Swami sir wants to leave, as Swami sir wants to leave earlier, we would request here all those who would like to put questions to him should come up first and then we will allow questions for the other two speakers. He has a commitment to go somewhere. So we request you to kindly ask questions to him first. Kindly state your questions briefly and to the point in English. In rare exceptions, if you really don't know English, we may allow in Malayalam to be translated by Brother M. M. Akbar. This is a question and answer time and not a lecture or a debate time. Kindly note that. Only one question at a time may be asked. For your second question, you will have to go back at the row again and await your second chance. I understand three mics have been provided for question answer session. Two in front of me, one on the left, one on the right for our brothers down here and one mic in the balcony for the ladies. Please stand in queue at one of the mics if you wish to put forward a question to the speaker and speak into the mic only when the mic is handed to you and your turn is due. We'll start the first question in the ladies section, then we come on on my right in clockwise fashion to the brother here, then on my left to the other brother and again to the ladies and so on we'll circulate the questions. In the interest of having a less time wasting, a more educative and an interesting question and answer session, our decision to allow or disallow irrelevant questions and not questions not connected to the topic will be final. In the interest of eliciting a proper response and a clear answer from the speakers, kindly state your name and profession before putting forward your questions. May we start with the first question from the ladies section please. First questions to the Swami please. Only questions to the Swami may be put forward first. Later on we will allow for the other two speakers. Thank you. Respected Swamiji, let me ask a question to Swami. I am Abdullah, lecturer for the college. Malayalatul and Vishnu. As you please. Uh, let me ask a question in uh, Malayalam. Okay. Punajanma. Uh, okay. Those brothers who can speak in English would prefer in English because both the audiences would know. And even uh, the other speakers I think would know, you know. Yes. And if you really don't know, then we will ask Brother Akbar to translate okay. after the question is put forward. Why are you wasting double time? So thank you. Uh, about the Punajanma. Rebirth. Rebirth and the life hereafter. Uh, which one, according to Hindu mythology? Can you explain? Yes, the Hinduism accepts the theory of rebirth. The life hereafter. The Hinduism accepts it. The, no, the, the common understanding about uh, the rebirth, the, the next birth is. The good and bad things that is done during in our life, if they are almost equal, you will be born in your next birth almost like this as a human being with the same status and things like that. But if your good actions, noble actions, noble thoughts, beneficial thoughts and activities, if that prevail, you will have a, a greater air, yeah, you will have a even in human birth. Uh, in a, a, a place where there are more opportunities, more facilities for you to grow, evolve spiritually. But on the other hand, if, you, if the bad things are done more in this life, that person's birth, rebirth is, uh, is, uh, is described as so in the subhuman level. They will, he will go to the subhuman level. This is the basic idea of the Hinduism. We accept Rebirth. Uh, next question. Any question from the ladies side? Uh, my question is uh, concerned with uh, your three philosophies in Hinduism. It, according to the Vishishta Advaita, you said that uh, 
God, uh, you can compare God to uh, fire and man to sparks. So they are both qualitatively the same. How can God and man be qualitatively the same and man make mistakes while God does not have any mistakes? He is perfect and He is super power. When we analyze the total existence and the status of the world, the individual and the supreme being, we have a, the, this philosophy accepts that there is a divine spark carried, carried in the heart of every human being. But that perfection is there, that full warmth and glow of the fire is in every, be, every human being. But that of effigence is not seen because of the bad actions by the individual. But if he makes up a, a mind, if he resolves himself to evolve, then by noble actions, the glow and warmth of the fire inside will be more and more manifest and will become one with the Lord's glow, warm. And the next, next question. Yes. My name is C.N. Abdullah Bishnathman. Say in the Bhavishya Quran, there is a shloga, Edasmin Nindre Malaysia Ajayi Orna Samanada, Muhammad Idikyada, Shisha Shaga Samanada. I want to know what it means and in which relative. I should be frank about this. I have not, I have not read that uh, Purana, therefore I am not able to uh, say my opinion about it. Parina Sameta would appear to be Parina Adia. I need Jasa Matran question to Rija. The next question uh, I am Dr. Zamira Mohammed. Um, I want to ask uh, Swamiji because you have asked us that every person has a right to choose their own Ishta Deva. So, you are giving freedom in choosing our own God. So, uh, even now, in this place we are not given freedom individually to choose our own Prime Ministers. So, how can we decide like that on a crucial thing as religion? Oh, that is easy. It is uh, difficult to choose your Prime Minister because uh, the various factors contribute to it. As far as the spiritual evolution is concerned, the decision is yours. You have the freedom. You can choose. You can evolve. You can one become one. You can become one with the supreme in your prayer, in the depth of your meditation. Uh, Namila, um, what we request, as this is a symposium, if the question is addressed to one of the speakers and other two speakers would like to comment, they should uh, let me know. If it's the same. If that is to say. No, the same question addressed to two, three. I came years. first because right. if anyone has to ask, tell me something specifically right. I could answer and then I should leave the place right. I am far away from Koilandi and it is getting right. late. No, we'll allow the Swami. What I said was if the father or the Zakir would like to comment on anything which is of common grounds to two, two points of views, they could comment on it. And what I would request the crowd to kindly maintain your cool. This is a symposium, a scholarly understanding between experts and uh, we would uh, uh, prefer you to uh, maintain the decorum. The next question from the unless, brothers. Uh, unless we, in a session like this, in an August assembly like this, when, if we, when we have met in the name of God, we must be able to maintain that coolness and then we must be fair not to criticize any view and this asserting that my view is the only right and truth and the others are false. That attitude is not what we want. We have assembled here in the name of the Almighty. Almighty, that love and loving concern and cooperation, that amalgamation, that spirit must we must prevail in this, in, this, in this August assembly. And then one more question I will answer. And then with your kind permission, I will leave. Swamiji, I am Abdul Nazar. I am an architect by profession. Uh, I would like to know what is the meaning of moksha and what is the purpose of meditation? Purpose of meditation is to gain moksha. Moksha is the state of uh, one's own perfect uh, state of being where he enjoys full freedom of his soul, he is one with the Supreme Being, 
he enjoys the beatitude. That is the state of moksha, and meditation is a means, a method, a path to reach that state of perfection. I think. A request, one question. Oh, yes, right, yes. One more. Uh, any ladies have any questions? I think they should be. As this one, right? Bismillah ar Rahman ar Rahim. We'll allow a lady and then a gentleman. On the different uh, so my question is that uh, in uh, Hinduism, the concept of creation, that uh, uh, Brahma is the creator and uh, there are different categories of people, that is uh, Brahmin, Shudra and uh, 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 what is Vaishnava and other people uh, uh, form from the different organs of the uh, Brahma. So is it, uh, I mean I am wondering whether uh, this is this true or what I have learnt is wrong. I just like to know about this. I think uh, things have not, have not been made very clear to you. The concept of creation in Hinduism is one thing and what you refer to is something else. That these are two different things. As far as the Hindus are concerned, we do not accept the fact that the word was created just the other day and it will end, end one day on a fixed day. No. What we accept is that the creation is a perpetual process in the, in the nature. It evolves. It is like waves in the ocean. It is there. It will go back again to pralaya. Then again, birds come up and again it will go on. It is an endless pro process. The creation, preservation and destruction, that is an endless process in the nature, in the totality of nature. That is the concept of creation in Hinduism. The other thing is, the differences between different castes, differences of differences in the human being, state, state, state status, that they are all very insignificant in the details about uh, the religious belief of uh, the Hindus, and if you are good friends, you sit with them, they will clarify. Very insignificant, they are not at all important ideas in Hinduism. Very insignificant, very, very relative. Respected yes. Swamiji, can you please allow some more questions? Hey, hey, pardon? Some more questions. Pardon? Only two are there. Hmm. To two. ask you some. Two yeah. more questions. Yeah. Oh, welcome. All right. My name is Muhammad Rafiq. I am American student. And my question is, he said the Vedas are the primary sources of philosophy, Hindu philosophy. Yes. Yeah. And my question is, what is the Vedic basis? What is the? What is the Vedic basis? for the principle of Advaita. Basic basic? Yes. Basic. What? What is the... Akbar, what is the mantra? What is the Vedic basis? What is the Vedic basis? The basis in Vedas. Vedas is Advaita. If you were to quote something from Vedas, propounding Advaita and also Punar Janma. No, no. I don't want to say that. Yes, yes. The Vedas proclaim, the Upanishads proclaim these, these ideas very much. Swamiji, caste system is the basic principle of uh, Hinduism. I understood. Uh, Chandogya Upanishad said, Tadya iha kapuya charana, Adya shahayate kapuya yonimba, Apadyeran sugara yonimba, uh, Brahm chandala yonimba, Swa yonimba. Uh, what's about your opinion, caste system? I told you at the beginning, that's not caste system that is, that is uh, explained there. What I told you in the beginning is that in our life, if uh, the predominance is for the good and noble activities, noble thoughts, you will have uh, your punarjanma in a higher region. If uh, the predominance uh, is towards the bad, tendencies are bad, towards bad things, then you come down to the subhuman level, even up to the rock. So that is the concept. If it is equal, you will get a similar life. If it is good, you, you ascend. So that is a, that's, a, that's all the simple thing there, not that it is accepted. I think, uh, I think that, that would be the, that was the last question, now we will allow only uh, ah. Father. Right. Father Gio, would you like to comment on anything before we leave, uh, give uh, Swamiji a leave? Any comment? Uh, 
Brother, any comments on the point? Before. Just a symposium, we have, we have a better understanding of the session. Uh, Dr. Zakirud uh, Swamiji has been very kind. He is, he is a very learned personality and uh, I would not think that we would have many amongst us who would understand he is from the Ramakrishna mission. I know they are very learned people. We have met many from such missions and they speak with a lot of sense and straightforwardness which we ourselves may not have so much knowledge. If he is presenting a point, we should appreciate that and the other speakers should be given due respect. Uh, thank you. Uh, the Zakir would like to have some comments. I am very thankful to Swamiji, the learned speaker, for spending so much time and answering so many questions. I would love to comment on each and every answer since I am a student of comparative religion. But since time is short, I will just choose three of the questions just to give my comments. And the first question posed was regarding reincarnation and Swamiji rightly said that in Hinduism they believe that if the person has done equal good and bad, he is reborn as a human being, if he does more, he reads the higher state. If he does more evil than good, he is born at a subhuman level. Rightly, Swamiji rightly described the Hindu philosophy which even I have read. And he rightly said that the Hindu philosophy says that if you do more evil, then you are born subhuman being. Like maybe like a dog, like a cockroach or philosophy, I agree with him. My question that I would like to clarify is that today, there is more evil in the world. Evil is on the increase in the world. So I am asking as a student of science and a student of logic that if evil is increasing, the population of human beings should decrease. But in the world we come to know that the population of human beings are increasing. So how do you, how do you reconciliate? Since I am a student of comparative religion, it's my pleasure to learn more about Hinduism. I would like, how do you reconciliate the theory of Hinduism about reincarnation when evil is increasing? The population of human beings should decrease but we find that the population of human beings are increasing. That's my comment. If you want to, yes. you can rebuttal. Exactly. Or I would like to speak about the second question also. No, one by one. Sure. <laughs> Silence, please. We thank you. You have been a very patient and an enthusiastic audience. You have been appreciative. Please don't get restless. I think that is not a very important question. Uh, the living beings in this, uh, on the face of the earth is so immense. So immense. So some of them must have merited to become human beings and they are coming. So we cannot uh, um, uh, clarify and say specifically this, this is the, this is the, these are all unimportant details. I think I request Dr. Knight not to give much emphasis on this. Okay, thank so you. Thank you. Want to close that point? I just want to Any clear. other point? I'm just, I wanted to clear. Fixing, since uh, Swamiji said that he has not read the Bhavishya Purana. Since I'm a student of comparative religion, I have read the Bhavishya Purana. So I would like to comment on the brother he posed the question that is the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, mentioned the Bhavishya Purana. And since I would like to learn from the Swami if I don't know, and if Swami doesn't know, I would like to throw some light. The Bhavishya Purana says in Parva 3, Khanda 3, Adhyata 3, Shlokas 5 to 8, I'm giving the translation that there will be a Malaysia. A Malaysia in Sanskrit means a foreigner, speaking a foreign language. There will come a Malaysia, a spiritual teacher, who will come along with his companion. His name shall be Muhammad. And Raja Bhoj, after giving this Mahadev Arab a bath in the Panch Garf, he will give his presence of reverence and speak to him with respect and say, I pay obeisance to you, O pride of humankind. You have created a great force. You have collected a great force to kill the devil. If you analyze this Bhavishya Purana, Bhavishya Purana is one of the Puranas as, the, as Swamiji rightly said. There are 18 Puranas which were compiled by Maharishi Vyas into 18 voluminous parts. The Bhavishya Purana, this says Malaysia, a foreigner, speaking a foreign language, a spiritual teacher whose name shall be Muhammad will come. And Raja Bhoj, after giving this Mahadev Arab, the Sanskrit word is Marusthal, meaning 
place of a sandy track or a desert. This man which the Bhavishya Purana speaks about the future is the coming of a man from the sandy desert whose name shall be Muhammad. And Raja Bhuj will say that this person is the pride of humankind. As the Holy Quran rightly says in Surah Al-Ambiya chapter 21 verse number 107, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ illa rahmatan lil alamin that we have sent the prophet muhammad peace be upon him as a mercy to the whole humankind as a mercy to all the creatures as a mercy to all the worlds this is the first prophecy the several prophecies in bhavishya purana i'd just like to throw light on one more verse in that in bhavishya purana parva 3 khanda 3 adhaita 3 shloka 10 to 27 it says that the malaychas has spoiled the land of the arabs arya dharb is not to be found there there was and devil who had been earlier killed by God Almighty but now he has been sent by a more powerful enemy these enemies will be guided to the true path and the devil will be corrected by a man known as Muhammad and further says that a shrewd man in the guise of Pichachas in the angelic disposition will tell Raja Bhoj that you need not go to the foolish land of the Pichachas for I will Purify you by my kindness where you are. Referring when the Muslim man comes to India, they will be purified. The prophecy continues that Arya Dharma will prevail. The religion of truth, the Deen al Haq will prevail. And he says that I have been sent by Ishwar Paramatma. My followers will be a man who is circumcised, who will not have a tail on his head, that's a shindi, who will grow a beard, who will create a revolution who will give the call for prayers, that is the Adhan, who will eat all lawful things, but will not have the flesh of swine. And the Quran says in no less than four different places, in Surah Al-Baqarah chapter 2 verse number 173, in Surah Maizah chapter number 5 verse number 3, in Surah Anam chapter 6 verse 145, and Surah Nahal chapter number 16 verse 115, Hurramat alaykumul maitutu waddamu wa lahmil khinveed, wa ma uhilla li gairilla bi. That forbidden for you for food, ah, dead meat, blood, the flesh of swine, and any food on which any name besides Allah has been invoked. So Quran prohibits the eating of flesh of swine, and Bhavishya Purana says the same. These followers of Ishwar Paramatma will not have swine. They will not be purified by holy shrubs, but be purified by warfare, and they will correct the irreligious people. These people will be called Musliman. This is in brief what the Bhavishya Purana speaks about the coming of a beloved Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. That was just to give my information about Bhavishya Purana. And as the sister asked... Uh, my reaction to it, uh, uh, will you permit me to say? Uh, sure, you're most welcome. No, I thought you said you didn't read the Bhavishya Purana. No problem. As far as the, the Hindus are concerned, I told you in the beginning that the supreme book authority for us is Vedas. And even among the Vedas, Upanishads, they are the supreme authority. The Itihasas, Puranas, everything, or the, the, the function of the Puranas, Itihasas, or other books in Hinduism is to interpret, to make the Upanishadic ideas more clear to the common people according to their level of intellectual understanding. So, Upanishads comes only second in authority. The prime authority is the Vedas, the Upanishads. I accept the Upanishads as the supreme and therefore I, have, I do not give much importance to what the Upanishads speak because I, I, have, I, I have direct access to the uh, Upanishads and therefore it doesn't mean that I disrespect. No, I respect. I respect every, Upani, every uh, Purana but I give the first place, the most important place to the Upanishads, to the Vedas. That is my reaction to it. Thank you very much, Swamiji. And I do agree with you that the Hindus first believe in most authentic are the Vedas, then Upanishads, then Puranas. I do agree with him. Swamiji does not believe in the Puranas or does not give it respect. I don't mind. But this is just the position of the Puranas. I, I, I didn't say I don't respect. I do respect. But, but, you, but, but I have not read it. Ah, in importance. That's right. I do agree with you, Swamiji. Thank you very much. Just a comment on choosing your own God in life. The Quran gives you permission to choose your own God in life. The Islamic principle. And I quoted a part of that verse in Surah Al-Baqarah chapter 2, verse number 256 says, There is no compulsion religion. Truth stands out clear from error. If you hold the hand of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you have held the most strong 
hand that never leaves you. And if you believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and reject the evil, verse number 257 says that he will take you from darkness to light. But if you believe in the devil, Quran gives you permission, you have a choice to choose anyone. But if you choose the devil, he will take you from light to darkness. Quran gives you the option to choose whichever God you want. But the true God is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which I described in the beginning part of my talk. Uh, thank you, Swamiji, very much. On behalf of the Salafi Learning and Research Center, Calicut, I thank you all very much for your esteemed presence amongst us and sharing your knowledge. And I give him a standing ovation. I would request the brothers to kindly give Swamiji a standing ovation for his presence and sharing so much information. <laughs> and we grant him leave for his other commitments. Thank you, Swamiji. Inshallah, we hope to keep in touch with you. We carry on with the question and answer session. Now, we would request the speaker. I would request one volunteer at each of the mics so it's regulated properly. One mic here on my right, one on my left, and one on the top. And whenever a person wants to ask question, I would request the volunteer to kindly raise your hand. Sometimes there's no one standing, I don't know whether the question is going to be asked or not. Right. One mic is there, I can see the hand. When someone is ready for a question, I would like the hands to be raised. Now we start from the top, one question there, one on my right side, left, and in a circular order. Kindly see when your order comes, raise your hand. Can we have the next question? Kindly address the speaker and put your question briefly and to the point. May we have the next question, please? Next question from the ladies section. Salaam alaikum. My name is... I'm posing this question to uh, Father. Uh, Father, you have said uh, that Jesus is divine. At the same time, Rekinar has said that such a statement is not present anywhere in the Bible. So, uh, how, do, how do you prove this? How do I prove the kid I wrong and uh, make him a Christian? Uh, this is a, a hermetical question. How to interpret the Bible? We have the Bible written within uh, a hundred years of uh, span. First we have the oral tradition. Then oral tradition were written down later on. So from uh, BC 1000 to AD 100, uh, these Bible texts were formulated and written. In the early Christianity, or the very after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the apostles, uh, the disciples of Christ, uh, proclaimed, they believed in Jesus Christ. And uh, in the beginning, they proclaimed that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, he is divine, he is the Lord, he is curious, he is the Son of Man. So different titles were given. And later on, the gospel writers or the evangelists, those who proclaimed the teachings of Christ, started proclaiming. Then we have the editions, Matthew, Luke, Mark, and John wrote four Gospels. Then we have uh, the different uh, apostles and uh, evangelists, disciples of Christ, uh, wrote other books uh, called letters to the different uh, Christian groups uh, of that time. So, first of all, we had uh, the proclamation, the kerigma of Jesus Christ, uh, who is Lord, who is uh, the, the expected Messiah, the Savior, then he, they started writing the, text, the teaching of Jesus Christ. So from the teaching of Jesus Christ, uh, take example from the uh, book of John alone. The book of John was written the last gospel between uh, AD 950 to 100. In the book of John gives a more in-depth uh, formulation 
which is being so can be called a theological formulation of the divinity of Christ as well as the humanity of Christ. In the text of uh, gospel, there are uh, I am sayings. I am the life and resurrection. I am the light of the world. There are seven I am sayings. I am in the Bible, both Old Testament and New Testament signifies God. When Moses asked the name of Allah, of the name of God, God said Yahweh. Yahweh means I am who I am. I am. So in the Gospel of John, Jesus asserts that I am means God is the life, the bread of life. I am the door. I am the resurrection, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. So, from the teachings of Christ directly, the sayings I am equals to the divinity of Christ. And the, one, the miracles which Jesus Christ worked because of his divinity. So, Christ being the divine, he one brought miracles which we have already read in the Gospels. And besides, the people of Israel were expecting a Messiah. So if you go through all the different books of uh, Old Testament, the Torah, we will be able to find out uh, the people of Israel were expecting a Messiah. And uh, all the Messiah will be the Redeemer, who will be sent by God. And in the Gospel, again, we see in the book of John, chapter 316, God sent His only Son, to redeem this mankind and out of his love and mercy. So we have from the sayings of Jesus Christ, from the miracles of Jesus Christ, from the early faith and belief of the Christians, we affirm and formulate as a dogma that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, he is divine as well as he is human. So he is a perfect divine and perfect human being. This is an action or to the answer to the question. I just have a brief announcement. Uh, Brother Abdul Bari and Brother Abdul Salam Kanur are to report at the gate. Their wives are waiting for them. Same wife. Abdul Bari and Abdul Saman, uh, Salam. Kanur, if you can kindly go to the gate. May we have the next question from the brother on the right? Yes, excuse me, Chairperson. Since, uh, since the Father made, I'd like to make a comment on that. Well, if it's true, then I have to accept Christianity. Yeah. Our Father has given uh, two quotations from the Bible, of Gospel of John. And he rightly said the Gospel does say in several places, Jesus Christ himself said that, that I am. He didn't give the reference number, I'm giving the reference number. It is Gospel of John, chapter number 14, verse number 6 says, for I am the light, the truth and the way. No man cometh unto my father but by me. That's the quotation father was referring to. Yes. And several other quotations, I am. I cannot say I had many quotations. Jesus Christ said, I am and father is one. Yes. In John, uh, Gospel of John, chapter 17, verse 20. It is not chapter 17, verse 20. It's chapter 10, verse number 30. You, you Check it out. That. The Bible is here. And my father of one is not in Gospel of John chapter 17, it's in Gospel of John chapter number 10, verse number 30. You can check we it can, up, Father. We can, refer, we can refer. Yes, you can defer, I'm sure of it. Chapter 17. Check it up. I'll just give my comments. Father said, no clapping, please. Father, no. We should not give you already. Father, please. please read Gospel of John, chapter 10, verse number 30. And my father, Rawan, is in Gospel of John, chapter 10, verse 30. Which I am quoting chapter 17, verse 20 and 21. Neither pray for these alone, but for them also, which shall believe on me through their word. That they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Father, you said, I and my Father are one. Now open chapter 10, verse number 30, and read that, Father, please. Pardon? 
Open chapter 10 and verse number 30. You said that Jesus Christ said, I and my father are one. Verbatim that statement is given in God, Gospel of John, chapter 10, verse 30. Can you open it, Father, and read it for the people? I just read what I said, chapter 17. Father, the thing is being recorded. What you said, Jesus Christ said, I and my father are one. That statement is not there in Gospel of John, chapter 17, verse 23. Now open Gospel of John, chapter 10, verse number 30. The, that statement will be there. You read so many words. We are quoting different texts. And we can quote so many texts from the... I'm sorry, Bible. Father, you, you made the statement, I and my father are one. Yes. If you open Gospel of John, chapter 10, and read it to the public, they will understand. Chapter? Gospel of John, chapter 10, verse 30. John, chapter 10, verse... 30. 3, 0. I and my father are one. That, that's the statement you made. It is being video recorded. You said that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, I and my father are one. This is a verbatim statement you had made earlier. But that is found in Gospel of John, chapter 10, verse 30. Now to explain this, I will quote both the verses, sister, for a better understanding. And as you said that people can interpret the Bible in a different way, I will give you the interpretation which, which is logical. If you quote Gospel of John, chapter 10, verse 30, and my father Avan, it's just out of context. If you read the context and link the verse which father said about Gospel of John, chapter 17, you get the answer. For context, father, you have to go to verse number 23. And I will quote it from my memory. If I'm quoting wrong, you can correct me, Father. Gospel of John, chapter number 10, verse number 23 says that Jesus entered the porch in the temple of Solomon. Verse number 24 says that the Jews surrounded him and they asked him that if thou art the Christ, tell us plainly. Verse number 25 says, I'm quoting, Father. If I'm wrong, you can correct me. Verse number 25 says, I have told you, but you believe not because you are not my sheep. The work that I do in my father's name, bear witness of me. Verse number 27. My sheep follow me because they hear me. Next verse. I give them eternal life. No man can pluck them out of my hand. Verse number 29. My father who giveth them to me, no man can pluck them out of my father's hand. My father is greater than all. Fine. Verse number 30 says, I and my father are one. Now if you read the context, the earlier verses say that no man can pluck these people, the followers of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, from his hand. No man can pluck them out of the Father's hand, that means God's hand, God Almighty. If you read the context, it means the plucking in purpose, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, and God Almighty are same. Suppose I say, my father is a doctor and he's a medical doctor, I am a doctor. In purpose, I and my father are one, but that does not mean one in unity. If you mean it means one in unity, then I have to go back to your verse which you quoted rightly. John chapter 17, verse, which, verse number 21, 20, 23, which says that if you agree that one means God Almighty and Jesus Christ claim divinity. If it means that you'll have to agree, according to John chapter 17, verse 21, 23, Jesus Christ said that I am in my Father. My Father is in me. I am in you, he's telling the apostles. That means if you say in one means God Almighty is same as Jesus Christ, then according to John chapter 17, verse 21, 23, you'll have to believe even the apostles are God Almighty. So do you believe in 12 plus Jesus Christ plus God Almighty to be 14 gods? No. So if you say, I and my one means Jesus Christ claimed divinity, Jesus Christ also said, I am in my Father, my Father is in me, I am in you. You read the verse you quoted. John chapter 17, verse 21, 23. It says that Jesus Christ is in the apostles. Does it mean that Jesus Christ as God Almighty is in the apostles? Are the apostles also God Almighty? No. It means one in purpose. It means one in purpose. That means Jesus Christ had this, delivered the same message of God Almighty and the apostles of Jesus Christ also delivered the same message which Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, preached. And further if you read John chapter 10, verse number 31, it says that the Jews picked up stones to stone Jesus Christ. I'm reading further. Verse number 32 says, that for which of my good works do you stone me? So Jews tell them, we don't stone you for good works. We stone you because you being a man, you blaspheme, saying that you are God. So then Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, verse number 34, 35 says, that it is said in your law and scriptures that ye are gods. And if you say to a person God, to whom the word of God has come, the law is not broken. And if, and if you read the Psalms, the 82nd Psalm, verse number 6 says that ye are God. 
whoever are led by the spirit of God, they are called as gods. The spirit is not broken. So Jesus Christ said that if you call to a person to who the word of God has come, then the law is not broken. He never claimed divinity. Read the context. You quote one more verse. That Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said he was son of God. You didn't give the reference, I'll give the reference. Gospel of John, chapter 3, verse number 16. Say, for God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever shall believe in him, shall not die, but have everlasting life. Now, the father said that Bible mentions that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, son of God. If you refer, Bible also says that Adam is son of God. Ephraim is son of God. David is son of God. Bible has got son of God by the tons. Anyone who is led by the Spirit of God is a son of God. That's what the Bible says. It says if you are a good person, following the rules and regulation of God Almighty, then you are son of God, we are children of God. But the Christians say no, he is not only a son of God, he is the begotten son of God. And they quote, John chapter 3 verse number 16, as Father said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever shall believe in him shall not die but have everlasting life. Now this Bible which I'm quoting is from King James Version and it's all, also present in the Douay Version which the Catholic believe. And the Father rightly said the Catholic believe in 73 books. And the Protestants, they have thrown out seven books from the Old Testament saying it's Apocryphy. The masses of the people don't know the meaning of Apocryphy. It means doubtful. Apocryphy. They have thrown out seven books from the Old Testament saying it's doubtful. The Bible with the King James Version and the other Douay version, they go back to the source about 300 to 500 years after the alleged crucifixion of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. According to the Revised Standard Version, the Revised Standard Version goes back 200 years after the alleged crucifixion of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. Closer to the source, more authentic is the source. And according to the Revised Standard Version, which has been revised by 32 scholars of the highest eminence, backed by 50 different cooperating Christian denominations. The Bible has... This a... is the Revised Standard Version. This is the Revised Standard Version, revised by 32 scholars of the highest eminence, backed by 50 cooperating denominations. If you open Gospel of John, chapter 3, verse number 16, the word begotten is not there. Because it's an interpolation, it's a concoction. It's a fabrication. Who says that? Not the Muslims. The 32 scholars of the highest eminence, backed by 50 corporate denominations, even the RSV of the Catholic edition. The word begotten is not there. Why? It is an interpolation. It's a concoction. And the Quran rightly says, They say Allah has begotten a son. It is indeed a most monstrous thing to say. As though the skies are ready to burst open. And the earth to split asunder. And the mountains to fall down to utter ruin. If anyone says that Allah has begotten a son, it's the biggest abuse you can give. As though the skies are ready to burst, the earth to split asunder. And the mountain to fall down to utter ruin. Maybe these 32 scholars of the highest eminence, they read the verse of the Holy Quran, Surah Maryam, chapter 19, verse number 88 and 92, and they threw out the word begotten from the Bible. It's no longer there in the Revised Standard Version. This is the Revised Standard Version. You can verify if you want, Father. So yet, there is no statement in the whole Bible where Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, himself said that he is God or worship me. In the book of John, chapter 1, verse 18, says, no man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him. So we are taking the context, the background of the believers. So the revealed uh, doctrines or revealed truths are accepted uh, by believers. These believers proclaim Jesus Christ uh, as Son of God. And uh, the Gospel of John chapter 1 verse 1 to 18 uh, speaks about uh, all these things. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and with Him, and the Word is uh, uh, entitled as Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ has ever so many titles, not only Son of God, uh, the suspected Messiah, the light, the light of the world, ever so many titles are there. So I am never coming again to the question of uh, uh, religion. There is the creed, there is the faith, there is the belief, which we proclaim. 
this is being formulated by the believers of Christianity, early Christianity, which has been transmitted to the generations. And the custodians of Bible are the believing community. So community has emerged and developed and became a community of Christians because they had this belief in Jesus Christ who is the Son of God, who is divine, perfect divine as well as perfect human. This is the teaching of a Catholic Church which we hand over to the Christians of our times. The Father has rightly commented on Gospel of John, chapter number one, verse number one, and he rightly said that in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, trying to indicate that the Word is Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, and he was God Almighty, and I rightly agree with Father when he says that we should understand the scriptures correctly. I would like to remind Father that the New Testament, it's originally written in Greek, if you agree with me, Greek and Aramaic, ancient Aramaic. It's not in English. If you read the Greek, in the beginning was the Word. If the Christians say that the Word is actually God, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. And the Word was God. If you change the Word, say Word is God, then the meaning will be, in the beginning was God. And God was with God. Do you mean there were two Gods? And if you analyze the actual meaning, the Greek manuscript, if you know Greek father, the first, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God. The first God is Hothios. The Greek, if you go to the Greek manuscript. It's Arche. The, it's in Greek. Uh, Arche, Greek, in uh, Greek. Uh, uh, it is, and the word is uh, Logos. No, 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 no. The first word, if you refer, if you have a Greek Bible in our foundation, we have the Greek Bible also. We also have the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament. It says, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God. The first God is Hothios, meaning God with the capital G. The second God is Tontheos meaning a small God with a small g. But if you read the Bible, the English translation, both the gods are with capital G. The original Greek word for both the gods is different. First is Hothios, meaning the God with a capital G. The second, Tontheos, means a fake God, a small God with a small g. But when we read the Bible, they have made a mischief, the translators. They have put big G for both. So if you correct, translate it correctly, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, original God, capital G. And the Word was God, small g. Small g means messenger of God. We agree Jesus Christ, peace be upon the messenger of God. And any Muslim who does not agree Jesus Christ, the messenger of God, he is not a Muslim. Entheos means the God. So it continues. The Word, number 14, was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, or full of grace and truth. The Greek word exactly rightly said, it is ton theos, meaning a God. So a God means not a true God. If you go further on the word, no? Entheos. Which it is? The, 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 the God. Ton theos, ton theos. There's only a hotheos and ton theos, only two are there. I have read the, the versions. It's hotheos and ton theos. Tontheos means a fake God, like how if you read in the Bible that Moses was sent as a God to the Pharaoh. You should read, Moses was sent as capital G, God to Pharaoh. And they know it is wrong, the translators, they put a small g. Where they should put a capital G, they put a small g. In Aramaic and Hebrew, there is nothing like small g and capital G. There is nothing like small g and capital G. So the Bible rightly says, in the beginning was Word, the Word was with God Almighty, and the word was God. The second God is a small g which means a messenger. But the criterion of this belief is the custodian who is the church. The church teaches uh, this belief in Jesus Christ. So uh, we proclaim Jesus Christ uh, as son of God by the teaching of the church which becomes uh, a dogma which is uh, proclaimed uh, through the generations. Uh, and not only this text alone, from uh, taking you from the Old Testament, the fulfillment of the, all the prophecies are fulfilled in the Jesus Christ. We again say Jesus Christ is the Son of God, is divine. And uh, the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus Christ. And the very faith of Christianity is based on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Unless Jesus Christ has risen, there won't be the Christian religion. So we firmly 
believe that Jesus Christ, who was born in Palestine, in Bethlehem, who lived in the Palestine, did miracles, uh, spoke God's words, uh, who, was di who died in the time of Pontius Pilate, was buried, uh, was risen, and is ascended to the Father, and he becomes uh, the Lord and God. And uh, St. Thomas, uh, in the same Gospel of John, calls God after the resurrection, my God and my Lord. So, not to take, quoting one or two text, the whole of, and continuing the other uh, letters of uh, St. Paul, letters of St. Peter, and so on, we read the same thing. Uh, letter of St. Paul to Philippians, uh, chapter 6, uh, verses, uh, chapter 2, verses 6 to 11, speaks about the canotic Christ, uh, who emptied himself and came down to the world, uh, one quotation I am uh, quoting from Philippians uh, chapter 2, verse 6 to 11. I quote, As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus, the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built it up in him, and established in the faith. Chapter, sorry, chapter yes. 2, verse 6 to 11. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, though not, uh, not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men, and being found in the fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and things in heaven and things on earth and things under the earth. And the very tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord to the glory of God the Father. Thank you, Father. Uh, I have I've asked uh, the brother uh, Dr. Zakir to sit down because what I said, we have got the basic idea of the appreciation. Father presented the Christian point of view, the church point of view. Brother Zakir presented his uh, study of the, from uh, references he has got. Uh, we leave it up to the audience to decide. May we have the next question from the brothers here. Next question to Dr. Zakir from the brother on the left. I am Abdul Latif. My question is uh, regarding the truth of God, the significance of God. Uh, Newton's law of thermodynamics says energy can neither be created nor destroyed. But uh, Quran and Bible says everything will be destroyed. It's a contradictory, no? It's against. And see, if the fifth is uh, nur, nur means light. Uh, other one, uh, um, light. Uh, the Bible says light, light is the God. So in that case, uh, what we are studying now is wrong. Science is wrong. Where, where, what happens? Uh, whether the science is wrong or the religion is wrong? My question is? Well, uh, the question, before I answer, I would just like to say, since the chairperson didn't give me the, the time, otherwise I could have answered it in every question of Father, but time doesn't permit us. You answer this question. The brother asked the question that the law of thermodynamics of Newton is saying that nothing can be created, nothing can be destroyed. That's what they're saying. The conservation of energy, which we do agree, conservation of energy. But you said that doesn't it contradict with science? See, science has not reached so far. Science cannot tell us everything. Science cannot tell us everything. Initially, there was something created. There has to be something. Then this situation arises that they are changed to different forms. First, there was something. Who created that thing? You ask Newton, who created that first thing? Do you mean to think there was nothing first? There was something. There was something, even according to the Big Bang theory, the creation of the universe. As the Quran says in Surah Al-Ambiya, chapter 21, verse number 30, it says, Avalam yara ladina kafaru, anna samawati wal arda, kaanat ratkan futak nahuma. That do not the unbelievers see <coughs> that the heavens and the earth were joined together and we clove them asunder. There was something, afterwards the law of conservation of energy says, nothing can be destroyed, nothing can be created. It changes form. It changes form. But that's an ultimate. Initially there was something. And we say, this something that was created, the creator is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Khalid. 
Hope that answers the question. Next question from the ladies section, please. Assalamualaikum. Uh, the question to Dr. In the question titled Women's Right in Islam, I heard you saying uh, that Islam can, doesn't. The sister, can we have questions on the topic of today? We have less time to cover up the, the topic of today. I don't think we would allow questions out of the topic. Kindly restrict yourself to the topic of the day. Religion, the right perspective. I would like to pose this question. I'm huh? Professor Nafisa Kadim. I came from Madras this morning. Uh, I would like to ask Father whether he can tell me if the New Testament, as we read and understand it today, was written during the lifetime of Jesus. Nothing was, nothing was written at the time of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ proclaimed the good news and he gave the great commandment, go and teach good news to the whole world. Then the apostles or the disciples of Jesus Christ, they proclaimed this teaching of Jesus Christ in the beginning of Christianity, say around uh, AD 30 to 70. Then later on, those who heard this word of God, we received this message through the inspiration of God, wrote down. First was uh, Mark, then we have Matthew, then there is Luke and then John. So at the time of Jesus Christ, nothing was uh, written down. Then we have the next question from the brother. Yeah? Uh, 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 there we have one brother. Right. Doctor, I am B.G. Herman. Uh, Doctor Sagar, may I ask a question regarding? Uh, uh, do you agree with me if I say the religion is written by men? Religion is written by men. Brother asked the question that do I agree with him that religion is written by men? Most of them are, not all. I agree with you, yes. Most of them are, but not all. The Holy Quran, the Holy Quran is the last and final revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It was revealed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I've given a talk, is the Quran God's word? And I've proved to an atheist, to a Christian, to a Hindu, to a scientist that the Holy Quran is the revelation of God Almighty. It is not written by human beings. Today people can copy the Quran. But originally, why should they it differ? was revealed yes. by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why should the religion differ? Why should the religions differ? You have to ask those people who have written the book with their own hands. The Quran says in Surah Al-Baqarah chapter 2 verse number 79. It says, بِعَيْدِهِمْ سُمَّا يَقُلُونَ هَذَا مِنْ إِنْدِ اللَّهِ لِيَشْتِرُ بِهِ سَمْنًا كَلِيلًا that woe to those who write the book with their own hands and then say this is from Allah to traffic with it for a miserable price. Woe to those for what they hand to write and woe to those for what they earn. So Quran says there are people who write with their own hands and then say this is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says woe to such people for what do they write, woe to their hands and woe to what they earn. Hope that answers the question. Father wants to comment, comment on Dr. Naik. Christians believe the ultimate and definitive revelation only through Jesus Christ. And by the time of Jesus Christ, the revelation is closed. So we as Christians, we accept the teaching of Quran. But for us, we believe that Jesus, the God has come down to the whole and he revealed totally, entirely, which is the ultimate and definitive revelation. So we don't want any other Revelation. May I ask a question? My question is, my question is to Dr. Naik. One of the fundamental articles of faith in Islam is the belief in faith, destiny. God knows everything, including your future. God has also decided what will happen in the years to come. In, even after millions of years, uh, the happenings has already been decided by God. And if it is so, why should a man do righteous deeds in this world? God has already decided your faith. Whether you do good or bad, uh, your reward is already there, he has decided. 
and uh, in that case if you do not do any good at all or if you do any good, if you do good or if you do not do good, may i request yes, you to put the question please the question is this the faith has already been decided by god in that case what is the fun in doing righteous things this question is mainly asked by those who want to marry in islam and also by those who have thank you uh, thank you any in doubt about to, islam i want to the question brother will we'll ask the question on destiny just before i give the answer i'd like to say different people say that their book is the word of god hindu say their scripture is the word of god christian say their scripture is the word of god muslim say the quran is the word of god so let's if you want to know which is the word of god put it to the final test which today the world is of age and science and technology if you apply scientific knowledge to all the scriptures you will actually come to know which is the word of god which i have done in my video cassette is the quran the word of god regarding the question of brother that if god almighty if allah subhanahu wa taala knows whether a person is going to heaven or hell whether he will do good deed or bad deed why is letting us lead this life of turmoil if allah knows destiny everything is written down why do we have to lead this life of turmoil it's a very good question though i don't know whether it fits in the topic or not but it's a very good question people misunderstand the meaning of destiny the quran rightly says that the moment a child is born the destiny his fate is bound round his neck allah subhanahu wa taala knows in advance what a person is going to do whether he is going to do good deeds or bad deeds let me give you an example let's suppose in a classroom there is a group of student who sit for an examination before the examination comes the teacher since he has taught the student for one year he knows very well that this student he is a clever student he will come out first in the class that student he will come second class that student a naughty student he will fail in the examination why because of experience now when the examination comes this student actually comes out first that student gets a second class that student fails just because the teacher predicted in advance that the person is going to fail can he blame that because the teacher predicted i have failed no the teacher had experience therefore the teacher could predict in advance whether the person is going to fail or not similarly allah subhanahu wa taala has given a free will to every human being but he has ilm aghab he has knowledge of the future what's going to happen what's not going to happen he does not interfere in your free will he gives you a free will for example if you come at a cross road and there are five roads road 1 2 3 4 5 allah gives you the choice to choose whichever road you want but allah knows that you will choose road b and you actually choose road b it is not because it is mentioned the destiny that you will choose road b that you have chosen road b it is because allah has ilm aghab he has the knowledge of the future in advance he knows that you will be choosing road b because he knows he has written down it is not because allah has written the destiny the reason that you follow it's the vice versa if you go further you come to another three roads a b c you choose road b allah knows in advance at the next junction you will choose road b because allah knows in advance he has written down the destiny not because it is written that you do it it's the vice versa allah has ilm aghab Allah also knows as the brother said whether the person is going to hell or heaven he knows very well so the question is why don't you put the person okay the moment you are born Allah knows he is being a good human being he will have faith put him to heaven that person he will commit murder he will commit adultery put him to hell why doesn't Allah directly put the person in hell or heaven the reason brother is because if Allah puts this person directly in heaven he will not object but if Allah puts that person in hell he will ask a question to allah subhanahu wa taala on the day of judgment why did you put me in hell why did you put me in hell allah knows this person going to do sin but that person does not know so if allah puts him in hell directly he will question allah subhanahu wa taala on the day of judgment why did you put me in hell he will question the quran says on the day of judgment no one can question allah subhanahu wa taala it is so crystal clear that a person will be put in hell he will agree that he has to go to hell he will only ask for forgiveness he cannot question so allah does not put a person directly in hell or heaven so that you get proof what you will be doing is good or bad as allah says in the holy quran in surah mulk chapter 67 verse number 2 we have made the life and death as a test for the hereafter we are leading this life and death for the test for the hereafter 
Allah knows very well whether the person is good or bad, but you do not know. To undergo the test so that you will be satisfied with the result. Teacher cannot say, without the examination I will fail you. The student will object to the teacher. Maybe I would have passed. Why did you fail me? In the same way so that no one can object to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala day of judgment, Allah lets the person undergo the test and waits for the result. He knows the result. You don't know the result. That's the reason he lets you undergo this life in this world. The next question from the ladies, please. My question is to Father. Uh, Dr. Zakir Naik uh, had mentioned that Christianity means uh, those people who uh, agree or accept the teachings of uh, Jesus Christ. So does that mean that people before Christ who did not get the teachings of uh, Jesus Christ were not Christians or Christianity is only pertain to people after Christ? The terms uh, Christians uh, comes from Christ, then Christians, believers uh, in Christ. So they not only accept uh, the teachings of Jesus Christ, but they accept and believe the person of Jesus Christ, uh, who is God, who the world made flesh and dwelt among us. So those who believe that Jesus Christ uh, is the divine person, a person in the Trinity and they become Christians. So the terms are used to recognize, distinguish between other religions only. The next question from the brother on the right please. Assalamu alaikum. I am Azim Siddiq, third year B.Tech, R.E.C. Caligate. My question is to Dr. Naik. So while explaining the concept of God in Islam, you had mentioned that God is unique. That is, you can't compare God to any human being or any human attributes. But in the same Quran, Allah says that Kallam Allahu Musa Taklima, that God spoke to Musa. So, so speech or talking to a person is a human act. So God Subhanahu wa Taala, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, can He take a human act? Well, there was a question that I said in my talk that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is unique, and there are certain qualities of man which if you attribute to God Almighty, he feels to be Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he asked a question that Quran says and, and he rightly quoted that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke to Musa alayhi salam. So if you tell me that God Almighty, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a mouth like the human being and he has lips, he has high to teeth and then he spoke moving his lips, then he's not God Almighty. Quran does not say that. Speaking, Allah speaks in various ways. The speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cannot be compared to the speech of human being. The moment you say God Almighty spoke with two lips, thigh to teeth and a tongue, then he is not God Almighty. There is nothing like him. Quran says he spoke. How he spoke, we don't know. Surely not like a human being. Hope that answers the question. The next question from the brother on the left. My question is to Dr. Zakir. Uh, Father Gio and Swami has given a secular view of religion. You have interpreted religion on the basis of Quran. And that Quran cannot go wrong. And it can go only wrong when someone has wrongly interpreted it. So I am bringing forward a contentious issue that is affecting the Muslims of today. Uh, that is the regarding the descent of hijab in the Surah Al-Azab which has led to the division of the Muslim space into two. So what we ultimately see here is that th th this is a public space. Here men sit here. That's a more private place. Women are confined to that place. So this is a very simple interpretation. If you elaborate it, you can uh, find a more uh, bizarre dimension like in Afghanistan where Muslim women are completely confined from uh, institutions. The brother has asked a question that I have interpreted religion according to the Quran. I gave the definition of religion according to Oxford Dictionary, not according to the Quran, according to Oxford Dictionary. And then I started my talk. But I believe that Islam is the only way of life. The brother asked me a question that how can you interpret the system of hijab which mentioned in the Quran. The brother didn't give the verse number, he was referring to Surah Nur, chapter 24, verse number 30, 31, which speaks about the hijab. Verse number 30 first speaks about the hijab for male, verse number 31 then speaks about the hijab for female. 
Surah Nur chapter 24 verse number 30 says, Say to the believing man that he should lower his gaze and guard his modesty. That means the moment he looks at any woman, he should lower his gaze and guard his modesty. Anything comes, brazen thought comes in his mind, you should lower his gaze. Same thing is mentioned in the Bible, in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 5, verse number 27 to 29. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, It is said of the old time that thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you that whosoever shall look it upon a woman to lust after her has already committed adultery in his heart. Who said that? Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, it's mentioned in the Bible. That means if any person looks at a woman to lust after her, he's already committed adultery in his heart. Same thing the Quran is saying. Say to the believing man that he should lower his gaze and guard his modesty. The next verse of the Holy Quran, Surah Nur chapter 24, verse number 31, speaks about the hijab for the woman. It says, say to the believing woman that she should lower her gaze and guard her modesty. And to display not a beauty, except what appears ordinarily of. And to draw her veil over the bosom, except in front of a father, a son, a husband, and a big list of mehram, the close relatives who she can't marry, given. There are basically six criteria which are mentioned in the Quran and the Hadith for the hijab. The first criteria is the extent which differs between the man and the woman. For the man, it's from the navel to the knee. For the woman, the complete body should be covered. The only part that can be seen are the face and the hands up to the wrist. If they wish to cover this, they are most welcome. All the remaining five criteria are the same for man and woman. Second criteria is the clothes they wear should not be so tight that it reveals the figure. Third, it should not be transparent so that you can see through. Fourth, it should not be so glamorous that it attracts the opposite sex. Fifth, it should not resemble that of the unbeliever. That means you can't deceive the people. You can't wear a sign, like for example, Om or sign of cross. It's a sign of Hinduism, Christianity. You can't deceive the people by wearing the sign of an unbeliever. And the sixth criteria is, you should not wear clothes that which resemble the opposite sex. The same message given in the Bible, in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 22, verse number 5, Bible says, the man will not wear clothes that which pertinent to a woman, neither shall a woman wear clothes that which pertinent to a man. If you read the Old Testament, first book of Timothy, chapter number 2, verse number 9, it says that the woman should be dressed up with sobriety, with modesty and shamefacedness. The women should be dressed up with modesty, with shamefacedness and sobriety. They should not have braided hair of gold, nor should they wear costly array, pearls, etc. And if you see the photograph of Mary, peace be upon her, she is dressed up exactly like the way the Muslim should be dressed up, because she was a Muslim. Her complete body is covered. The only part that you can see of Mother Mary, may Allah be pleased with her, is the face and the hands up to the wrist. This is the exact dress how women men should dress. The reason the brother asked, why should we be dressed up like that? The Quran gives the answer in Surah Azab, chapter 33, verse number 59. O oh Prophet, tell your wives and the believing women that they should wear the cloak when they go abroad, so that they shall be recognized, and it will prevent them from being molested. It will prevent them from being molested. Now let me ask you a question. There suppose two twin sisters who are equally beautiful. They are walking down the streets of Calicut. One is wearing the Islamic hijab, both of them are beautiful. One twin sister is wearing the Islamic hijab, completely covered. The only part that is seen is the face and the hands up to the wrist. The second twin sister is equally beautiful. She is wearing the western clothes, the skirt and the mini. Both are walking down the street and round the corner there is a hooligan waiting for a catch. I am asking the question, which girl will it tease? Will it tease the girl wearing a skirt or a mini or will it tease the girl wearing the Islamic hijab? Which one will it tease? Which one? Which one? Yes, wearing the skirt and the mini. You expose and you invite trouble. Therefore, Quran rightly says that hijab has been proclaimed for the woman to protect the modesty. To protect the modesty. If you know, today on average, every day more than 1,900 cases of rape are taking place in America. More than 1,900 every day. Supposed to be one of the most advanced countries of the world. I am asking the question if you implement the Sharia there that any man looks at a woman with a brazen thought, with an unashamed gaze, he should lower his gaze. And all the women should be modestly dressed up, wearing the hijab, complete body covered, the only part that can be seen is the face and the hands up to the wrist, like what's mentioned, like what you see Mother Mary wearing. May Allah be pleased with her. And suppose if after that, someone commits rape, 
Islamic Sharia says capital punishment, death penalty. I'm asking the question, if you implement the Sharia in America, will the rate of rape, will it increase? Will it remain the same or will it decrease? It will decrease. It's a practical law. You implement the Sharia and you get results. That is the reason the least rate of rape in any country in the world is in Saudi Arabia. Next question, please. I'm asking this question to Dr. Zafir Nair. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Fatima and I'm a student of Lawson. I'm having a classmate who is a Qadian. According to Qadians, they are the true Muslims and others who don't believe, who believe that uh, Prophet Muhammad is the last Prophet sent to earth. All others are kafir. Uh, they, they are using the same verse, that is verse number 40 from chapter 33, to prove that Prophet Muhammad is not the last messenger sent to earth. Their argument is that Prophet Muhammad is the last messenger sent to earth by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with a book and there can be many other messengers without a book and we have to believe in them. How can I prove long him answer. wrong? It will be a long answer. Is that your handle? Will you answer? Ask? Huh? The question is out of the topic but uh, if uh, it may take a little long time I think to handle. One answer. Okay, by public demand, I think people want to answer. The okay. sisters... The sisters asked the question regarding Kadiani. Surah Azab, chapter 33, verse 40 says, مَا كَانَ مَحَمَّدٌ أَبَا أَهَدٍ مِّنْ رِجَالِكُمْ وَلَاكِ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ وَخَاتَمُ النَّبِيِّينَ وَكَانَ اللَّهُ بِكُلِّ شَيْنْ أَلِيمًا Which means, Muhammad, peace be upon him, is not the father of any of you men, but is a messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and is Khatamu Nabiyin, is the seal of the Prophet. Allah is all-knowing, full of knowledge. I know the Qadianis, they quote this verse and they say that see, the Quran says that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is Khatamun Nabin. That means he is the last person who has got a revealed message. He is the last Nabi which has got a message. But he is not the last Prophet which will not be given a message. It's confusing. What the Qadianis believe that Nabi is a person who has got a message, who has got a revelation. And Rasul is a person who has got no revelation. So what they say, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa is a Nabi that's a prophet who has got a revelation. But he is not the last Rasul. That means there may be other prophets who will not be given the message. This is the statement. But if you know a little bit of Arabic, even if you know Urdu, you will understand that Rasul means a person who has got a message, a risalat. So they have translated Nabi and Rasul vice versa. The Rasul means a person who has got a message. And Nabi means a plain prophet. That means there are prophets who do not have any revelation. They were referred to as only Nabi. And Rasuls are those prophets who have been given a revelation, a risalat, a message. Every Rasul has to be a Nabi. It's compulsory. Without being a Nabi, he can't be a Rasul. So if you know Arabic correctly, you can tell them that Quran says, Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the messenger of Allah and is Khatimun Nabi'een. That means the last of the prophets. Now for becoming a Rasul, you first have to become a Nabi. For example, if you have to pass standard 8 or standard 9, if you have to pass that, First, you have to pass standard 1 and standard 2. Without passing standard 1, you can't pass standard 8. So moment I say that from today onwards, no one will pass standard 1. It includes that no one will even pass standard 8. So Quran says, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is khatimun nabiyin, is the seal of the Prophet. But naturally, it means both. If it's the seal of the Prophet, just a plain nabi, it also includes Rasul. And Rasul means a person to whom a message has been given. So beloved prophet is the last messenger as well as the last Rasul. Last messenger and last Rasul, last Nabi and the last prophet. He is both. And anyone who does not believe in this, he is not a Muslim because he is going against Surah Azab chapter 33 verse number 40. Next question from the brothers. We will allow just another 2-3 questions, another 15 minutes for the session. Can we have the next question please? Question to Mr. Sakir Naik. 
he told us the first that god can convert god can convert to man god can convert to man but man cannot but he cannot convert to back uh, the reason that uh, god loses all his powers and attributes but uh, the believers of our devotees of rajanish or satya sai baba or all other avadas doesn't believe god loses all his powers and attributes this just a conversion without losing his powers and they just acquiring a physical attributes physical features of man to live among which people that's all so there is a question that god almighty can become a human being i said he can but he will not because quran says in surah buruj chapter 85 verse number 15 16 god is the doer of all he intends allah subhanahu wa taala can do everything what he intends but he does not do ungodly thing he will never become a human being why if he becomes a human being why will a person become inferior what benefit he gets regarding your saying that rajnish and satya sai baba they believe that god almighty become human being without losing powers it's contradictory like you are telling me this human being is a fat thin man you can have a fat man or you can have a thin man you can make a fat man into thin but he no longer remain fat you can make a thin man into fat but he no longer remain thin you can't have a fat thin man it's meaningless you you cannot have a tall short man can you have a tall short man a tall man can become short a short man can become tall but no longer remain short a tall short man are two opposite things it's meaningless similarly if you say god almighty became human being what is the definition of human being they have a beginning they have an end god almighty has got no end no beginning human being required to eat god almighty does not require to eat human being required to sleep god almighty does not require to sleep so if you say that god almighty became rajnish in human form does rajnish require rest or not does he require not he requires rajnish required to eat or not he requires to eat so the test for knowing whether he is god or not is the holy quran walam yakullu kufanat there is nothing like him the moment you can imagine what god is he is not god almighty hope that answers the question next question from the brother on the left my name is mujib i am an engineer with mba uh, actually i wanted to uh, clarify my doubt by all of the three but uh, okay. now since now two uh, are there at least yeah, yeah, two yes so this is about uh, how to worship god is it by simply observing some strictures or uh, practicing some values if what is the fate of a polytheist or atheist who is a philanthropist after his death father you want to answer from both the basic concept of uh, worship is because god is almighty he is a creator he showers blessings on us so this is uh, expressed uh, through human languages so we have prayer the namaskara it is on uh, methods of prayer we have a uh, prarthana in uh, religions we have puja in hinduism so these are uh, different rituals so i already said uh, as a cult uh, the different ways uh, and forms of worship and so this is to be uh, to submit ourselves totally to god's will and about you said about uh, it is and uh, unbelievers they are philanthropists they are, uh, are people who do service to the people to human generation and if they do those good things with their own conscience i think god will save them so we don't worry about the those who are atheist or believers god knows and god will save them for they follow their inner conscience which is enshrined through the revelation of god yeah thank you the next speaker the brother asked two questions the first is what is the form of worship in islam and second is what will happen to an polytheist or an atheist who does philanthropic things etc will he be saved will he go to heaven etc what is the form of worship islam believes as the holy quran says in surah al-dhariyat chapter 51 verse number 
وما خلقت الجن والانس الا ليعبدوا وي هاف كرييتد ذا جن اند ذا هيومن بينجز نوت بت تو ورشيپ مي ذا كرييشن اوف ذا هيومن بينجز اند جن از تو ورشيپ الله سبحانه وتعالى ذا عربيك ورد از عباده ات كمز فروم ذا روت ورد اب مينز سليف سيرفنت ماني بيبل هاف ذا ميسكونسبشن ذات صلاه برير از ذا اونلي فورم اوف ورشيپ it is one of the forms of worship it is not the only form of worship what's the meaning of ibadah ibadah means you have to follow the commandments of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala abd means a slave the moment you follow the commandments of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you are doing ibadah besides salah what we offer prayers that one form of ibadah even abstaining from the food which allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prohibited like pork alcohol you are doing ibadah if you don't do adultery as the quran says surah isra chapter 17 verse 31 come not close to adultery it's an evil opening other road to evil you are doing ibadah if you love your neighbors quran says surah maun chapter 107 verse number 1 to 7 you are doing ibadah if you're honest in your business you are doing ibadah whatever commandments of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you follow that is worship in islam whatever allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prohibited you from doing and if you abstain from doing those things that ibadah marrying and having sex with your wife is ibadah because that prevents you from prostitution which is haram so whatever laws of the quran you follow that is ibadah realize the second part what will happen to a polytheist who is a philanthropist what will happen to a person who does shirk the quran is very clear cut in surah nisa chapter 4 verse number 48 and surah nisa chapter 4 verse number 116 that allah subhanahu wa taala will never forgive the sin of associating partners with god almighty that is shirk any other sin if he wishes he may forgive but the sin of shirk he will never forgive he will never forgive so anyone who dies as a mushrik he has got no salvation and the criteria for salvation in the holy quran is given in surah al asr chapter number 103 verse number 1 to 3 we say wal as innal insana lafi khus illa alladhina amanu wa amilus salihati wa tawassaw bil haqqi wa tawassaw bis sabr that by the token of time man is verily in a state of loss except those who have faith those who have righteous deed those who exhort people to truth that is do dawa and islah those who exhort people to patience and perseverance these are the minimum four criteria for a person to enter jannah is to say that a person has got no faith but is a philanthropist he has righteous deed only righteous deed will not get you a ticket to heaven only being a philanthropist you will not obtain salvation similarly only having iman in allah subhanahu wa taala and not doing righteous deed will not take you to heaven all four criteria are equally important iman righteous deed exhorting people to truth and exhorting people to patience and perseverance if any one of this is missing you are not going to go to heaven under normal circumstances this is the criteria for salvation in the holy quran may we have the next question please uh, my name is shajir i am a medical student my question is to father julio papoli you said uh, jesus christ is son of god then why are christians worshiping Jesus Christ instead of the God himself. We are worshipping Jesus Christ because he is we accept the oneness of God but we God is triune. So God the Father is God, Son is God and the Holy Spirit is God. So we worship Jesus Christ the holy spirit and god the father uh, the comment from the speaker the question posed was that why do you worship jesus christ peace be upon him and the father rightly said according to the teachings of the church they believe in trinity and as i mentioned earlier that anywhere in the bible the word trinity does not exist i challenge anyone to take out the word trinity it's not there it's there in the quran The Quran says in Surah Al Imran chapter 3 verse number 171 it says wala taqulu salasa don't say trinity in ta khairu lakum this is stop it better for you it's against trinity but if you ask a person who learned in the christian dumb he will try and prove to you about trinity the closest verse in the bible 
which any Christian can talk about Trinity is the first epistle of John, chapter number 5, verse number 7. It says, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father and the Word and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. This is the closest verse in the whole Bible which you can try and think the belief in Trinity. First epistle of John, chapter number 5, verse number 7. But if you read the Revised Standard Version, this is the RSV, the Revised Standard Version of the Bible, as I mentioned, revised by 32 scholars of the highest eminence, backed by 50 corporate denominations, even the Church of Fathers, if you're a Catholic, it is there. It is there. Even they are backing this. Even they are backing this Bible. Revised Standard Version. Revised by Thaitu scholars of the highest eminence, backed by 50 copying denominations, because this Revised Standard Version goes back more closer to the source. 200 years after the alleged crucifixion of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. And according to these scholars, this verse has been thrown out from the Bible as an interpolation. It's no longer there. This verse does not exist in the Revised Standard Version. It's an interpolation. It's a concoction. It's a fabrication. Who says that? Not I. Not the Muslims. Thaitu scholars of the highest eminence backed by 50 corporate denominations. But when you ask a Catholic priest, he will tell you, we believe in the Catechism. The Father is a person. The Son is a person. The Holy Spirit is a person. But they aren't three persons, they are one person. See, I know English. That's the Catechism. That's the catechism of any Catholic you ask him. The church will say, the Father is a person, the Son is a person, the Holy Spirit is a person. But they aren't three persons, they are one person. I am asking a question, what English is this? If suppose that three triplets, and if one makes a mistake, can you hang the other one? No, why? Because each one is a different person. And if you ask any Christian, what is the description of Father? So he will tell you according to the Bible, that Father is like God Almighty, like Santa Claus, sitting in the heaven with the earth as his footstool. That's the mental picture he has, a Christian, of the Father. The moment he says, the Son, you start thinking of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. Like the one you see in the King of Kings, like Jeffrey Hunter. A blonde hair, he has got a good nose. He has the picture of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him in his mind. If you ask, what is the meaning of Holy Spirit? He quotes to you from the Bible, somewhat like a dove that came upon John the Baptist. Or like the, at the fire, the fire of Pentecost. These three pictures are different. All three pictures are different. And however much you try and superimpose all these three pictures, it will yet remain different. But when you ask the Christian, how many pictures you see, he will tell you one. Believe me, he's lying to you. The Father will make a comment. The, honor, the concept of Trinity, uh, you read chapter Matthew, chapter 28, verses uh, 19. Go ye, therefore, this is a uh, greatest commandment uh, Jesus Christ gave to his disciples. All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And the uh, book of uh, uh, Corinthians chapter 1, uh, chapter 13 verse 33 says, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. So, in this, there are texts like this which uh, proclaims the Trinitarian formulation. Late, the church formulated as a dogma and said the word Trinity. So, in the Bible, we have the concept in the name of Father and Son and the Holy Spirit. Later, the church fathers. Uh, formulated as a dogma in Trinitological formulations and it is called as God as triune but God is one. The Father rightly quoted the Gospel of Matthew chapter number 28. The word Trinity is not there. Did you hear the word Trinity? It's not there. I rightly said the word Trinity is not there. And Father said that Jesus Christ, peace be upon his disciples, that go into the way of the nation and teach in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. It is contradicting with the saying of Jesus Christ if you open the Gospel of Matthew. Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 10, verse number 5 to 6 says, He told the disciples, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. You can open the Bible and check it up, this Father. I'm speaking from my memory. Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 10, verse number 5 to 6. He told the disciples, Go ye not into the way of the Gentiles. Who are the Gentiles? The non-Jews, the Christian and the Muslims. We are Gentiles. Go ye not into the way of the Gentiles. 
and you enter in not into the city of the Samaritans, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, it's mentioned in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 15, verse number 24, that I have not been sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, came only to the Jews, only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, as the Holy Quran says in Surah Al-Imran, chapter 3, verse 49, that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was sent as a messenger to the Bani Israel. In Surah Saf, chapter 61, verse number 6, that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, the son of Mary, was sent as a messenger to the Bani Israel. He never claimed divinity. There's, the word Trinity does not exist in the Bible. It is the teaching of the church. What I'm going to base my argument is on the teaching of the Bible, not of the church. Jesus Christ told the apostles to go first to the uh, Israelites, the lost sheep. Then this uh, preaching was uh, given to all the people of the world. And the very birth of Jesus Christ, uh, the angel said to the shepherds, Fear not, for behold I bring you good news of great joy, which shall be to all people. And for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is the Christ the Lord. So we have several quotations, uh, several texts. So only how to interpret uh, hermeneutical interpretation and church interpretation and teaching of the church. So I follow the teaching, official teaching of the church, the magisterial. Thank you, Father. Now we'll only allow two short questions and kindly the speakers, I request them to give short answers so that we keep to the time schedule. Uh, the next question I think is from the sisters on the top. My question is to Dr. Zakin Naik. My question is how to judge a person's taqwa, especially for the choice of a partner? The question. The question. Sisters ask the question that how do you judge the taqwa of a person for the choice of a life partner? Taqwa means God consciousness, means piety, means sobriety. Sister, you can try your level best. For example, some things you can judge. Beauty you can see and judge. Wealth you can see and judge. It's easy. If he has so many million rupees, he's rich. If he has less rupees, he's poor. These things are easy to judge. When it comes to taqwa, it's difficult to judge. What you can do? If he does not have taqwa, you can very well know this person does not have taqwa. If he is dishonest, if he cheats, if he does not give due rights to his employees, if he harms the neighbor, you can very well say this person does not have taqwa. To know he has taqwa, what you can do, you can outwardly judge him that this person is honest, he does not bribe anyone, he does not cheat anyone, depend upon his nature and the qualities you can say, maybe he has taqwa. That he prays five times a day, he gives his zakat, he go, if, if he's elderly, he's gone for hajj, etc. Depending upon the qualities which you can see, you can say, maybe this person has taqwa. But you can make a mistake, because people can even deceive you. He may not be honest and yet seem to the people to be honest. On the face of it, he may be honest, but behind the, behind the curtain he may be dishonest. So, whatever you know of the person, you may be right, you may be wrong. You have to try your level best to investigate. As the Holy Quran says in Surah Hujura, chapter 49, verse number 6, whenever any information comes to you, you check it up. You check it up and confirm before giving the verdict. Hope that answers the question. Yeah. Thank you. Now we'll have just the, la uh, this is the last, I think, that's the third one. I told three questions, this is the last one. Huh? This will be the last question. I am Aisha Vichyoda. ചോദിക്കുന്നത്രോക്തമായിട്ട് I spoke first of all, about, uh, 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 you are talking question. about uh, the revealed religion, sir. Uh, Father, could you kindly just repeat the question? You uh, know, if you are asking a question, for those who cannot the three Semitic religions, uh, the Judaism, Christianity and Islam, are the revelatory religions. 
and he is asking a question whether Hinduism is uh, divinely proclaimed religion. Am I correct? Sapa Angi Rikinade, E. Moon Madangalayim, Deva Protangalai, Angi Rikinade, Satharan and Amalparina, Pashi Levit and Vajanam, Lepichu and Vishusik in the Ita Angle, Angi Rikino. Could you just repeat that? You know, that question they didn't get some of the people. Church rightly speaks about uh, all the Semitic religions, uh, Judaism, Christianity and uh, Islam as revealed religions. Church accepts that. That's right. Any... Uh, I am my no, you. No, question. that was the last question. I'm sorry. We know you are interested, you are enthusiastic. We appreciate your enthusiasm. But we we'll kindly make you bear for a few minutes by the... We require, if you can respect the vote of thanks, kindly sit down. We have Professor Abdu presenting the vote of thanks. We thank you all for all your interest on behalf of the Salafi Learning and Research Center, Professor Abdu, to present the vote of thanks. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah. Ni'amaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'ifiruhu. Wa na'udhu billahi min shuroori anfusina wa min sayyati amalina. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we are very thankful to you all for making this function a very great success. We, I, on behalf of the Salafi Learning and Research Center, thank uh, Dr. Zakir, his brother, Dr. Muhammad Naik, his associate, uh, Dr. Shuhaib, and all other his all his friends. Then, Father Gio Payapalli, Swami Gogula, uh, Gologananda. Professor Abdurrahman Sahib, our young and adventurous scholar Yamiam Akbar, Director of SLRC, KB Abdulatif Maulavi, its President CB Abdurrahman Kuti, and all beloved brothers and sisters who made this function a grand success. Thank you, one and all. Jazakallah khair.